Loosen up. To be tense is the surest way to fail in any undertaking, great or small. To desire success is a splendid thing, but to pursue success too intensely is to make certain of missing it. The carefree approach in any endeavor is a shortcut to success. In music, in sport, in study, in business life, many people fail or advance very slowly because they make hard work of it. Treat your work as fun. Regard the difficulties as part of the game. Laugh off the annoyances. This, of course, is the real difference between work and play. Take it easy, loosen up. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's from Matthew 1130. Thank you. Well, once again, Emmy Fox fits in sort of in an indirect way. For those of you who've joined this but missed last week, uh, we're in, uh, embarking on a, a six week set of what I call mini pilgrimages for self reflection and renewal based on the fact that Easter and so many other um, celebrations of the time whether we're talking Iranian or Rus, uh, whether we're talking uh, Diwali when it happens here, whether we're talking uh, Ramadan uh, and Jewish Passover, the times for reflection, for taking a look at one's spiritual walk, at one's, one's walk in life as it should be reflected in one's spirituality and in one's actions in reality. Uh, and so I suggest, you know, I suggested that we don't need to do this in the sort of all-encompassing way, such as Ramadan, where from sunup to sundown, you neither eat nor drink. And it's a time when you're supposed to be considering your whole life based on the seven pillars of belief and righteousness in Islam. Um, nor like the pilgrimages, uh, oh, what's the one, the famous one in Spain, I'm just drawing a blank, where you walk a thousand miles uh, doing reflection, stopping at churches uh, or sacred sites on the way. But what you can do is a mini pilgrimage, because the pilgrimage actually is a time for paying attention for becoming more aware of the divine, of your experience. Every step in the pilgrim way is ideally a new awareness of your surroundings, of the divine in your surroundings. But you can do it every day. Five minutes, three minutes, stop, take in, Listen to the bird song, breathe some of that air. Get the scent of the air each day because it changes the sounds around you. And within that context, I suggested that we take a week each day of the week or however often you are able to choose or choose to do it to reflect on one of the six what the Quakers call testimonies, um, encouragements about how to live life in a righteous and in a loving and a spirit-filled way. Uh, so last week, I suggested that people take a look at their walk in simplicity, living in simplicity, uh, expecting, acknowledging the divine in its simplicity. And for those of you who've been doing it, I hope this was an experience that brought you some new thoughts about how you can walk, how you can live. This week, well, first of all, let me go through the six testimonies of, uh, of Quakerism. Uh, the acronym is SPICE. You start with simplicity, and then there's peace, 
And then there's living in integrity, acting on what we believe, speaking truth, doing what we say we will, acting in the way that our belief calls us. The next one is community, where we support each other in our faith, where we support others in their spiritual walk, but also in being part of a welcoming community, a welcoming group, a feeling welcomed in the world, accepted, loved. The next testimony is equality, treating everyone everywhere as equally precious to God and recognizing that all of us have gifts, divine gifts that we can share and ideally feel called to share. And from the Quaker perspective, which I believe is for all of us, also recognizing that there's that spark of God living in the heart of every one of us and that each of us needs to be aware of and respond to that spark of God in every man, woman, and child. And if we want to extend it further into every rock, every tree, the entire world, and then the final testimony is stewardship, or some of the, some Quakers call it sustainability, caring for the earth and all its pieces, all its inhabitants, responding to all of God's creation with caring, using only an appropriate amount, which takes us back to simplicity, of the earth's resources, and working to protect all that is on this earth. So this, today, the second week, we're going to deal with peace, which is, in the broadest sense, seeking justice, seeking healing for all people, uh, taking away causes of war. But that, that's more surface. Uh, we need to look farther than that because if we're talking peace, peace covers so many aspects of our being and of the spiritual being. Um, let's first start with the definition of biblical peace. Uh, this, this I found on the internet. Uh, biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict. It is taking action to restore a broken situation. It's more than a state of inner tranquility. It's a state of wholeness and completeness. And then looking at the New Testament, there's five different uh, meanings associated with peace in the New Testament. One is the absence of war or chaos. There's also peace indicated as a right relationship or we might say a wholesome or connected relationship with the divine, with God. Peace is also indicated as a good relationship among people. And peace is also an individual virtue or a state of being, tranquility or serenity as examples. And then also peace in the New Testament is a part of a greeting formula. And if you're at all familiar with uh, interactions, transactions, meetings in the Arab states, you know, where Christianity came from, where Muslim, uh, Islam came from, uh, peace be upon you is the greeting and the responses and also with you. So that's the greeting. And if you think here in this country, how valuable it is if we can say something similar to those whom we meet for the first time or for multiple times. I give you peace, peace be upon you. And of course, it's part of the Christian uh, religious ritual as well. So I wanna start with where all peace inevitably needs to start from, and that's ourselves. Uh, the way I think that there's inner peace, which then leads to 
external peace, living in peace, spreading peace. So inner peace and uh, another definition. Inner peace refers to a state of being mentally and spiritually at peace with enough knowledge and understanding to keep oneself strong in the face of discord or stress. Let me say that again, because this is really important. And particularly in COVID times, you need to stay and be able to stay angry. A state of mentally and spiritually at peace with enough knowledge or personal understanding to keep yourself strong in the face of stress or discord. In other words, not do not be knocked loose into upset. This particular definition goes on. Being at peace is considered by many to be healthy and the opposite of being stressed or anxious. And the statistic I heard recently from a mental health center, 60% of our population, they're talking United States, but I think it goes perhaps even broader worldwide, is mentally stressed right now in mental disarray. Peace of mind is generally associated with bliss, happiness, and contentment. Peace of mind, serenity, and calmness are descriptions of a disposition free of the effects of stress. It can be as considered a state of consciousness, a state of enlightenment, uh, which can be cultivated by various forms of training. Think mindfulness, which is uh, if I dare say it this way, a craze sweeping uh, Western cultures right now. Uh, prayer, meditation, uh, Tai Chi, yoga, all of these help you enhance your connection with stress. Um, it can be also called knowing oneself. I also tie it, though they didn't mention it here, I tie it in with the Orthodox tradition of the metaphysical of the unceasing prayer, which however you do unceasing prayer is certainly a form of meditation. Uh, and you know, Hinduism, Buddhism have their own processes. I wanna talk a little bit more about the state of unceasing prayer because I think it's often misunderstood. In Orthodox communities, the idea is that you begin a mantra and you just keep it repeating in your head until it runs on autopilot have mercy upon me, a sinner, and I forget the next line, and you just keep repeating it. But my experience, when I'm really good at it, and having watched others like Mother Teresa, there is also the unceasing prayer of what I call the eternal connection, where you feel the connection, the sense of peace without words, but you are carrying it with you as an anchor, as a beacon that you're following. All this is representative of maintaining, developing, improving your inner peace and thus the peace you can carry to others. Uh, and it, uh, there's a mention in this particular article that the 14th Dalai Lama, uh, Tansin Gayatso, emphasizes how important inner peace is to living in the world. Now, I came across some references by other writers about inner peace, what it means and how, what, how it affects us in the world. And I'm going to share some of them with you uh, to give you a reference for your own walk this week. Uh, someone named Gerald Jampolsky, inner peace can be reached only when we practice forgiveness. Forgiveness is letting go of the past and is therefore the means for correcting our misperceptions. Shaina Lewis, we may not speak the same language, but the foods we eat, the way we carry ourselves, the way we relate to one another, and our deeply ingrained spirituality reflect a bond that is still there. There is a sense of inner peace and ease I now have that wasn't there before. I can move forward with my life 
with intention, and I might add with peaceful intention and acceptance behind everything I do. The Peace Pilgrim, who I mentioned in previous talks, and if you're not familiar with her, check her out on the internet. She, she has a cool story, though she's now quite long gone. She said, world peace will never be stable until enough of us find inner peace to stabilize it. And then uh, Dabashi Smrita, I may not be saying the name right, says, forgive yourself, be calm and be kind, and nothing will disturb your inner peace of mind. And then Sifo Knoshi, never cling on to something that takes away your inner peace. Build courage and let it go. So for your pilgrimage this week, consider how you can live and promote peace in every aspect of your wheel of life. And I've talked about wheels of life before. Um, if you want me to send you a copy uh, that I use as a reference point myself, uh, just contact me and I'll be glad to do it. Uh, and so uh, the, I don't know if he's Buddhist or Christian because he was involved in Christian communities. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who I think has recently passed, talks about the need for each of us to be peace. That one cannot be contributing to peace in others or in the world unless one is peace on the inside. So looking at the various pieces of our lives, and I'm going to explore each one in a minute, what you might consider in your mini pilgrimage, in your meditations, in your prayers, is how might being peace and living peace and making peace look like in the parts of our world. Because this isn't just one thing like world peace or my inner peace. It's every aspect of how we live. So for each section, here are some ideas that I've jotted down. And if I'm really on top of things after service, I will send you a copy of these questions for you to reflect on this week. And if you're listening at a later time to this presentation, just contact me if you'd like a copy. So thinking of the family aspect of your life, a question, am I living in my family and connecting in it, with it in such a way that each member of my family, and this doesn't matter if we're talking a blood family or for those of us who have felt the need to create an intentional or contractual family or both. So that each member of my family knows that I show them my honesty and fairness and my love. Another question, am I a good example to my family of living peaceably with others, with the divine? and with this earth? Do I give respect to the spark of God within each family member? Do I honor the boundaries of their being and of their life and spiritual walk? Now we'll move to the issue of the financial part of our lives. Do I generate my income in ways reflective of God's love for all? This particularly hits me because uh, having as many phone lines as we do for our various ministries, I get so many calls from people whose sole objective is try to, uh, shall we say, hornswoggle or manipulate me into giving them some of my money or some of my commitment or some of my action, as opposed to honorable presentation. You know, selling can be an honorable thing if your goal is to help people make wise decisions, given the information that you present to them or the opportunities you present to them. Another question, 
Do I work to assure that the money I spend avoids supporting organizations which behave in unloving, exploitative, or immoral ways? For some people, buying from Amazon would fit expending toward organizations that are doing things that are immoral. There's a lot of conversation right now on the media about the issue of buying cotton clothing from cotton fields where in China, the Uyghurs are forced to do slave labor. Next question, how can I use my finances to better encourage peaceful energy in this world? It may be with expenditure, uh, with well, how we expend. It may be with donations. It may be with how we do not expend or how we do not draw funding. And then does my, do my financial choices reflect, reflect my internal peace? I have in my various spiritual activities and you know, walks doing the lift on therapy for people. I have encountered people who try to find peace by what they spend and how much they spend. I've had people boast about how much money they're making, how expensive their car is. And it's clear that they're not living in peace. They're not being peace. They're seeing, seeking to find a sense of peace or okayness for themselves by how they spend their money. Reflect on how you spend your money and what it might indicate. And is there a compulsion? Uh, I remember someone I knew in business when I was in business many years ago who was reflecting on his early life and how he basically spent himself into debt even though he had a good paying job buying drinks for people in bars, uh, buying fancy cars and taking people for rides, paying for people to go on trips with him. It was all because he himself felt unworthy of respect for being who he was. It doesn't need to be that way. If you're being peace and living in peace, you know you are beloved of God as you are. And your choices can reflect that. Think of the Amish. They live in peace in their choices. They live simple lives. They live financially righteous lives. The next aspect to consider is our physical being because being peace must be reflected in our physical being too. So do people experience your peace in the physical actions that they witness you take? Uh, as I was writing this, I was thinking of the, the Amish I know and their gentle approach to life, their nonviolent approach. And an experience I had as a child when I was walking down the street and I saw two nuns walking ahead of me, obvious because of their garb. And a, a, a little puppy came trotting to sniff him out and one of the nuns quickly kicked him away. I have a feeling that that nun wasn't, despite her garb, being peace or living in peace. Another question, do I care for my body in a way reflective of living in internal peace? of being peace and living in external peace as well. How about interpersonal relationships? A question. Do people experience your peace in their interactions with you? It used to be said among Quakers in the old days that you could tell a Quaker by the peaceful appearance of their face. Do I model peaceable transactions with the world and with its inhabitants? And as I was writing this, I realized 
I need to do some work on this because I've been really short tempered the last couple or three weeks. Uh, that's not good for being peace or living in peace. But part of also living in peace is being able to acknowledge where you need to work and improve things. So it's all of a, all of a peace when you are in peace. And then a question, have I gathered enough insight and wisdom about God, the spiritual walk and this earth so that I can, when asked, share with others to help them develop understandings and skills that enable them to create more peaceful relationships with others. How about the spiritual side of you? Are you engaging in regular practices that help you stay connected with the divine and with the divine peace? I've mentioned mindfulness, meditation, yoga as examples. The peace pilgrim would walk in the woods and connect with that of God in the stones and with the trees. It is an acknowledged effect now that when you walk into the woods, and hug a tree, you feel better. There is a connection. The divine in the tree connects with the divine in you. Another question about the spiritual walk. Am I able to consistently walk through life centered in divine spiritual peace, no matter what the outside circumstances? If you think of people you know around you, you'll realize how many, it doesn't take but one minor incident to have their complete sense of peace and well being completely disarranged. I think of it, I talk of it often as resilience, because within resilience is, uh, oh, I can get through this, things will get better. In fact, I only recently realized that's a connection with divine peace. When you know that the world is heading and your life is heading toward better and that you can deal with whatever is handed out, that's divine. You're connected with divine peace. You're spreading it. Do you allow yourself to peaceably connect with others whose spiritual path or spiritual experience is different from yours? Remember, part of this church's philosophy is there are many paths home. Chances are, because you are with us, you have encountered people for whom they well, for, who consider that you're allied with the devil, or you're going to hell, thank God, as Sister Pepper used to burlesque those who are judgmental. But when you're at peace, you can accept where others are and share love with them. And another question on your spiritual side, do you remain what the Quakers call tender, receptive, open to messages and guidance from the spiritual world, which can help you build more inner strength, strengthen your sense of inner peace. And from there, share that inner peace so it becomes outward peace that others can experience. Career, does the work you do communicate honor, respect, and fair treatment to your fellow workers and those whom you serve. Have you given thought to what more you can do within your career, the work you do? And that doesn't mean necessarily just paying work, mind you. To spread a sense of okayness of divine love and personal well being and acceptance to the denizens of this earth and to the earth itself. Emotional, your emotional side. Do you stay actively alert for indications of emotional unpeace within you that need to be dealt with so that you can identify them as I mentioned for myself earlier so that you can heal them and generate more inner peace and thus more peace to share outwardly. Uh, check your actions, your emotional responses, your ability to be resilient does it serve as a guide that for others to emulate? Do they experience and understand that 
it's your divine inner peace that enables this and that they can have too. And do you need to strengthen your connection with the divine? The unceasing prayer that I mentioned earlier, for example, so that even in the most trying times, your inner peace is there and cannot be disturbed. What about leadership? Do you lead and encourage others by peaceful means? I was just talking with uh, a gal I've met who differentiates between leaders and bosses. She says, I want to be a leader in my company. Leaders help others grow, help others find the way and help others accomplish. Bosses, she says, they just say, do this or else. Well, the first shows an inner peace. The second does not. Are you able and willing to encourage others to find peaceful solutions to their troubling solutions? That's leadership. Do you give respect and honor to all with whom you deal as a leader or as a superior? Do you seek to instill a culture of peaceable peacefulness and honorable transactions in the organizations in which you work? So here we're dealing with peace emanating from inside you. I want to take a, a step farther out now from the immediate people we interact with. Um, so how about, how can you contribute to peace throughout the world? Uh, Father Richard Rohr, whom I quote often, uh, has a piece I'm going to read, not in its entirety, it's excerpted, that I think is worth reflecting here. He says, in Jesus' teachings and in his life, and I want to remind you here that Father Rohr talks about the cosmic Jesus who has come to many peoples in many forms, in many sets of words, but the message has always been the same about God's love. So in Jesus' teaching and in his life, we see modeled nonviolent peaceful action. He encourages us to likewise turn the other cheek and not return vengeance, or I'll say violence with violence, there is no way to peace other than through peacemaking itself, which I will suggest goes back to being peace within. I goes on, I like to use the example of a small boat crossing the Gulf of Siam. You're wearing a lot of people having to escape by boat. They have been since Vietnam from places where living was untenable. And now think the Rohingya, for instance, or those in Thailand who are being slaughtered by the military and have to, have to escape by boat or by jungle. So he says, I like to use the example of a small boat crossing the Gulf of Siam. There are many people called boat people who leave the country in small boats. Often the boats are caught in rough seas or storms. The people may panic and the boats can sink. But if even one person aboard can remain calm, lucid, knowing what to do and what not to do. In other words, I add, being peace. Then he or she can help the boat survive. Their expression, face, voice, communicates clarity and calmness. And people have trust in that person. They will listen to what they say. One such person can save the lives of many. Think Mother Teresa as an example. That's my ad. Our world is something like a small boat. Compared with the cosmos, our planet is a very small boat. And many are panicking because our situation is no better than the situation of the small boat in the sea. We have become a very endangered and dangerous species. He says, we need people who can sit still, able to smile, and who can walk peacefully. We need people like that in order to save us, to save our planet. And Mahayana Buddhism says that. 
you are that person. When you understand you cannot help but love, to develop understanding you need have to practice looking at all living beings with eyes of compassion. When you understand, you love. And when you love, you naturally act in a way that can relieve the suffering of others. You can help them find peace in themselves and in the world. So God, we thank you for having brought us all together. We thank you for the sharing, the learning, the shared love, the shared peace, for the support for each other in this community as we seek to walk closer to you and to be in your service. We thank you for watching over us and bringing more good to us as we depart from here and walk through your world. And we thank you for helping us to lift this world up and bring it more peace during this week of reflections about peace. Help us to find more peace inside and to share more peace with the world this week and guide us back the next week so we can rejoin the congregation again. We say thank you for all the good and all the guidance. And amen.